Hello and welcome to Let's Learn Mainframe. In this video, we are going to talk about the evolution of mainframe operating systems followed by RAA's features of a data processing system and then how mainframe implements RAS using its Sysplex architecture. Mainframe development occurred in a series of generations starting in the 1950s. Few of the first generation systems were IBM 705 in 1954 like this and IBM 1401 in 1959 like this. In 1964, with the introduction of OS360, things changed radically. Earlier systems such as the 1401 were dedicated as either commercial or scientific computers. The OS360 could perform both types of computing. In fact, the name OS360 refers to the architecture's wide scope, 360 degrees to cover the entire circle of possible usage. 360 was also the first of these computers to use microcode to implement many of its machine instructions, which was quite opposed to having all of its machine instructions hardwired into its circuitry. Now let's see how that microcode benefited us all. Prior to OS360, each computer was basically an one-off with its own unique instruction set okay and programs written for one computer would not run on another computer without either modifying the whole program or at least for recompilation okay so if, if you write one program for computer one with a specific instruction set and then you want to run that same program on a second computer it will not run that much easily there was a very hard coupling between the instruction set and the computer hardware. As a result, we often need to run the program constantly according keeping in view the hardware in mind or at least we need to recompile them to run on newer machines. As you can understand, it's too tough to make progress in that sort of environment. Microcode, what it did was a computer hardware technique that imposes an interpreter between the machine level instructions, the CPU hardware and the programmer visible instruction set. Okay, so this is what programmer writes. And uh, this is on the other hand side, we have the, all the CPU hardware and this is the microcode uh, translator. Microcode translator. As such, the microcode is a layer of hardware level instruction set that implement higher level machine code instructions or internal state machine sequencing in many digital elements, right? So microcode typically resides in special high speed memory area, which is attached with the CPU and translate machine instructions into sequence of detailed circuit level operations. So if you just write that move A to another variable B, right? So this is something human legible format. Basically this microcode, it will translate into number of uh, move, uh, let's say um, uh, from circuit one to circuit two or something like that, all, all machine dependent code. And this will not be move, it will be all, you know, digital signals and kind of things, right? So this is the purpose of, this was the purpose of microcode. So it, it separates the machine instructions from the underlying electronics so that instructions can be designed and altered more freely. It also facil facilitates the building of complex multi-step instructions. You can have multiple such steps, you know, written one after another and all of them will be converted into the actual electronic signals by this microcode. So now we can understand it, um, it, it, it brought a revolution in the term that programmers did no more need to focus on the underlying hardware. They can more focus more towards the business logic, developing reusable applications. And as a result of this, number of high level uh, languages like Assembler, COBOL, Fortran, PL1, they all started and we moved 
to a new age where we can code our programs without keeping in view the hardware in our mind. To have a single code that can run on all available hardware and operating systems with little or no modification, that seems a silly thing today to talk about. But that's the biggest technological achievement in computer world in 1960s and microcode made that possible. Since the introduction of OS 360 in 1964, IBM has significantly extended the platform roughly every 10 years. System 370 came in in the 70s, System 370 Extended Architecture 370XA that came in 1983, Enterprise System Architecture 390 ESA 390 that came in in the 1990s and Z Architecture came in 2000. As of today, typically there are five different operating systems that can run on mainframe, Z OS, Z VM, ZVSE, Linux for Z series and ZTPF. Additionally, an Unix segment which is also called OpenMVS or OMVS can run on top of the uh, JDOS operating system as a subsystem of JDOS. Mainframes are designed for processing huge amount of business data. Trillions and trillions of transactions get processed every day. For such critical data processing systems, three factors determine their success. Reliability, availability, and serviceability. Collectively, they are known as RAS or RASH. Reliability is the ability of a system to continue processing without failure, except for the scheduled outages. JDOS servers have a mean time to failure of 40 years as of today. That means they are guaranteed to run for 40 years continuously without any failure. Availability is the degree to which a system in a specified operable status can be found at random times. The system can recover from a failed component without impacting the rest of the running system. And lastly, the serviceability is the capability of a system to determine why a particular failure has occurred and the hardware and the software elements can be replaced with very minimal or no impact to the operational systems. So an available system generates reliability. It rarely requires downtime for upgrades or repairs and if the system is brought down at all by an error condition, it must be serviceable. That is an easy to fix approach must exist within a relatively short period of time. Now to understand how mainframe architecture has been designed to achieve these RAS features, we shall look at some of its very basic and fundamental configurations. In a simple sense, mainframe is multiplicity. You always get to see hundreds of CPUs, thousands of tapes and hard disks, gigabytes of RAM, numerous terminals, everything here's a pool of resource. If we are to draw a logical picture for the same, here's a big box that represents the mainframe and we have, let's say, a pool of uh, terminals connected to it also a pool of tapes and pool of printers. Within the mainframe box, we, we have a pool of a CPU, RAMs or main memory and now something unique, control circuit and channel. A channel is basically a connection between external input output devices like printer or terminal and the control circuit. Again, a control circuit contains logic to work with a particular type of input-output device. A control circuit for a printer would have, uh, for example, much different internal circuitry and logic than a control uh, circuit for a tape drive. Latest mainframes can have up to 1000 such channels. These control circuits are in turn connected with the main memory and CPU. In older systems, they used to be made up of copper, 
but these days we have ESCON uh, or ESCON and FICON or FICON channels which are made up of optical fiber. Now mainframe brings in a new concept called logical partitioning or LPAR short uh, LPAR which is a subset of this hardware pool dedicatedly put under a single operating system. The wonderful thing is within a single mainframe hardware box you can have multiple such independent LPARs parallelly running each with its own copy of operating system. Now if we are to redraw that figure again so here's a big box that's the mainframe hardware Within it, we have multiple small boxes called LPARs, each one with its own operating system, CPU, memory, I.O. channels and control circuits. All of these LPARs are running parallelly. We have a special piece of hardware called PRSM, which is a process resource system manager that enables such an LPAR architecture. Now as a system admin, we have full freedom to dynamically change resources under each LPAR. Like uh, LPAR 1 should get double processor time than LPAR 2. The operating system in each LPAR can be separate. They can be stopped and restarted separately. And hence, if the system in one LPAR crashes, there is no effect on the other LPARs. Now for most practical purposes, there is no difference, for example, uh, three separate mainframes running ZOS on three different hardware boxes and three LPARs running on the same mainframe doing the same thing. Now taking a step forward, when such LPAR systems start sharing data and workload between each other, under the supervision of coupling facility that's called a parallel CISPEX environment. As a result, a single workload can be dynamically distributed for parallel execution on different nodes. Things get really fast here. Coupling facility is a mainframe processor having its own memory, channels and a built-in operating system but no input-output devices. The CF operating system is nothing like JWS and it has no direct user interfaces also. Let's see how this mainframe architecture can achieve the best of RAS. In the event of a hardware or software outage, either planned or unplanned, workloads can be dynamically redirected to available servers, thus providing near continuous application availability. If any hardware and software maintenance or replacement required, those can be done seamlessly without affecting the other LPARs. Again, we can redirect workloads to other LPARs. That enables a great serviceability index. As a result of having high availability index and high serviceability index, the reliability quotient automatically goes very high. 